Uh, Jun asks, what can you put on the Bitcoin blockchain? Andreas, how many transactions can fit in a block with and without SegWit? In addition, what kind of other data can you include in a block? Thanks. Uh, Jun, great question. I can't give you an exact number because it depends on the nature of transactions. Transactions can vary greatly in their size. The most basic transaction, which is a single input, single output, pay to public key hash uh, transaction, if I remember correctly, is 266 bytes. Um, the average transaction has one input and two outputs. It's a bit bigger than that um, because it has change. Uh, if it uses a more complex construct, perhaps a uh, pay to script hash, it's going to be a bit longer. If it uses uh, a multisig and is paying out of a multisig, it's going to have some redeem scripts. That's a bit longer too, and so on and so forth. So the transaction size can vary. On average, a one megabyte block can fit about 1,800 transactions, I guess, maybe up to 2,000 transactions. And, um, and now that we have segregated witness on the Bitcoin main chain, uh, that can expand to, I would say, about four, uh, four and a half thousand transactions in a single block. So. You can look at the statistics. I haven't looked at them recently to see exactly how many transactions, but certainly we've seen an almost doubling of the capacity um, of the uh, block in order to fit more transactions. I think the factor was 1.7 uh, last time I looked. Now, the second part of the question is also interesting. What kind of other data can you include in a block? Now, keep in mind, Blockchains are the world's most expensive and inefficient form of data storage. And they are so uh, structured intentionally because um, decentralization requires us to make some sacrifices in terms of efficiency. And that means you can't store a lot of data. And when you try to store a lot of data, it gets very, very expensive. However, one of the interesting things you can do with a blockchain is that instead of storing the data itself, you can store a hash or fingerprint of the data, and then store the data in a secondary network, such as IPFS, um, which is the interplanetary file system, or um, any other form of storage. You could even store your data on a Google Drive, if you wanted to use a centralized service. And so with that, what you can do is have the data stored outside, but you can take a fingerprint or hash of your data and embed that in the blockchain. What good does that do? Well, what it does is it gives you the ability to prove that a certain piece of data existed on or before a certain time. That's called proof of existence. And that's been a useful service um, for legal purposes. You can do notarization um, for a variety of uh, uses. In fact, there's a protocol that allows you to compress many, many such hashes, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of them. Um, into a single transaction uh, that timestamps every block. And that protocol is called Open Timestamps, and it allows you to timestamp all kinds of data into the Bitcoin blockchain. Similar protocols exist for other blockchains uh, that can be used to timestamp data too. Marcus asks, what exactly is meant with metadata? Are metadata visible and useful? Yes, Marcus, metadata is data that refers to something external to the system in which it's stored. So in Bitcoin, all the data that's about Bitcoin is data. And any data that's not about Bitcoin, but about something else that's stored inside Bitcoin is metadata. Um, that's one of the ways to look at it. Oh, of course, the, the term is probably a bit more flexible and vague than that. How could I upload a hash of a document in an up return field myself? Is there a special command on Bitcoin Core which allows me to do so? I don't believe there is. There are a number of other applications. Probably the best... Um, the, there's a couple of, of good ones. Um, one is called Proof of Existence. And I believe it's at proofofexistence.com, which allows you to upload the hash of a document and put it in an up return for a small fee. Um, another one is a more, uh, more developed protocol called Open Timestamps, which is a project by Peter Todd, uh, which is really interesting because it scales the ability to do proof of existence for billions of documents by aggregating all of this information in Merkle trees. 
um, and putting only the root of the tree in each op return transaction while storing most of the metadata off the chain on open timestamp servers. So it's a good compromise um, solution. Open timestamps is what you're looking for there. Marcus asks, in the same manner, could I upload any text I want on the Bitcoin blockchain as long as it's less than 80 bytes? Yes, you can. And finally, Marcus asks, could Ethereum be used more efficiently for storing hashes of documents instead of the Bitcoin blockchain and why? Um, yes, Ethereum could be used more efficiently for storing hashes of documents instead of the Bitcoin blockchain. And, and the primary reason is that Ethereum will allow you um, to store a lot, a lot more data, and as a result, has uh, bigger scaling issues uh, than the Bitcoin blockchain. So um, on Bitcoin, you can store 80 bytes in each op return, and you know it, it will cost you a, a transaction fee to include that in a transaction. With Ethereum and a smart contract, you can store. Um, quite a lot of data, and you still have to pay a transaction fee, but there is no 80 byte limit. It's really a matter of uh, metering that with gas. In fact, there is a particular type of contract called a deed, or non-fungible token, which is basically storing hashes of things. These can be uh, deeds like real estate titles, or crypto kitty hashes, or various other things that are non-fungible, unique items. And storing those hashes inside a tokenized um, contract that allows you to transfer these tokens from person to person or from owner to owner, uh, and that's called ERC721. It's rather interesting. Tracy asks, "Can a block with hash data, such as an academic certificate hash stored in an op return, also have regular mineable transactions and therefore be treated just like any other block?" Tracy, yes. In fact, the transaction that has the op return in it can also have other things like regular payments. Only one of the outputs needs to be an op return. Um, the other outputs in that transaction could be payments. So you can embed it in a transaction that does other things as well as the op return. And of course, that can be among many other transactions, and the block is just like any other block. <laughs>